All right, well, good evening. Welcome to Live at Five at Sandy Springs Community Church. Do not adjust your sets. Uh, I'm Gary Lane. Pastor's over here hiding in the corner. He said, you started off this way. I don't have to get up there. So I'm Gary Lane from Functional Christianity, and I'll be speaking today. So we just want to invite you in, and thank you for being with us. And uh, it's Memorial Day weekend here in Atlanta, and so this sermon is going to be about something. I just wanted to talk about remembering. And so uh, we're going to process through that. But I wanted to pray for us first. And there's been a lot going on in our country this week. So uh, you all know that. And if you haven't, um, if you're listening to this online, there's been a lot happening in our country this entire month as we celebrate Memorial Day weekend at the end of May. It's been a crazy month. So I'm going to just pray for us and then we'll get started with God's word. Father, thank you so much that you're God and that you're in control. And Father, we want to lift up all the families of, uh, that are hurting right now. There's people in the hospital. I know people that have lost their children this week, um, both in uh, different parts of the country. Father, we just want to lift up families right now. And you're the answer to all of these things. But somehow, Father, we lose sight of that. Would you just, would you make your presence known through the local churches, through the organizations that work to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would you, would you Father, just minister to those families. Second Corinthians talks about that we can comfort others with the comfort with which we've been comforted. So Father, we pray for comfort. We pray for healing. We pray for healing for our nation, for our communities, uh, for our families, Father. And maybe it starts with the families and works its way up. But Father, would you be comfort to those? Would you be peace to those? Would you be, would you be um, just salvation to those that need it, Father? And we lift you up and thank you for our time tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, thanks for being here. And it's uh, Memorial Day weekend. And so I've had so many thoughts and there's been so many things happening in our country this week. There's been, uh, there's been uh, uh, violence in schools. There's been violence in New York. There's been, there's, we went to a funeral this week and I, I, my heart was broken as I watched a man uh, walk to the front and pick up the ashes of his son and carry those out of the church. Uh, his 35-year-old son died this week, and so we were at that funeral, and so it, it's been crazy. We have a war going on in Ukraine. We have other nations starting to mess with each other and fight, and so there's just a lot going on in the world, and so then we take and we say, oh, we're going to pause for Memorial Day, so I wanted to talk about remembering, and Memorial Day, I think, if you're old South or if you're older person, you might remember as it Decoration Sunday. And it was a time, and there's about five states or five cities that have, they all claim to have been the original Memorial Day weekend, the original Sunday for Memorial Day or Memorial Day. It wasn't until the 70s that the government made it an official American uh, uh, holiday. I think it was in the 70s. Uh, but Memorial Day celebrates those who've lost their lives uh, in some way. Typically, in the beginning, it was in war. Uh, dates all the way back to the Civil War. Both sides of the Civil War celebrated their losses, uh, celebrated this day as a time to honor those that died uh, fighting for their cause. And so now we've, we've um, sort of moved that into a, a different holiday where it's memorializing all the people that have lost their lives. And so, I, I mean, I think back, it's been over 20 years since September 11th uh, happened in 2001, and it's like 2022. And so uh, it's cause for memory. For those that were in the buildings as victims and lost their lives and those that went in to save people and lost their lives so memorial day weekend so then i'm like okay where is that in the bible and how do we look at this and what does remembering do for us and because my ministry is functional christianity i, I try to be functional in this and so i'm going to go somewhere maybe a little dark to start but we'll get to the we'll get to the good at the end but i wanted to talk about remembering uh, what typically happens is we end up with lots of pain lots of anger and lots of confusion. So we've had a, we've had a school incident this week and, and uh, people have lost their lives in the school. And so there's pain there. There's families that have lost their children. That's the most, probably the, one of the deepest pains you could ever experience is to know that one of your children, uh, you outlived your children. That's, that's terrible pain. And there's anger. Why did it happen? And how could they let it happen? And who let it happen? And why did it happen? And there's all this confusion. So typically when we remember things, we want to remember those that passed away and that, that were fighting for a good cause. 
But even in this week, we're remembering the loss of lives, innocent lives. And so uh, we, we will always experience pain. We'll always experience this anger. And we're always going to experience confusion. And we have this big question every time, don't we? Why? And so as a society, we want to be very civilized. We want to be very... Um, um, we, we decided that we were going to be very good people, but we don't know what good looks like. And so we're trying to, we're trying to create a moral society. Uh, there, was a, there was a religious group in the, in the 80s or maybe even the 70s called the Moral Majority. And they were going to be the moral people and they were going to have the moral high ground. And they were going to be, they were going to be the ones that decided what moral looked like. And that was going to fix all our problems. But morality doesn't fix our problems. Because we can't legislate morality, can we? We can say this is illegal and this is illegal and you're only allowed to do this and you can't do it on Tuesdays and only after five o'clock and not after midnight. And we can, we can create massive amounts of laws to try to create a society that's safe. But we can't create a safe society, can we? Because you cannot legislate this morality. And so this is the problem that the United States and even other countries, Russia is fighting with the Ukraine. They want their land back or they want the Ukrainians want the Russians out or the Russians want to take over. And it's like, why? Why? Why can't they just be civilized? Why can't they just get along? Why can't they just like each other? And so we, we see that we have problems within, within our society by race, uh, by ethnicity, all kinds of different reasons. Uh, sexual orientation, we have fighting whether we can or can't do something. And we always ask the question, why? And there's no good answer to why question, is there? I do a lot of counseling, and I've done counseling, traumatic counseling, where someone's child has been run over by a car, and, and their deepest pain is that they've lost their child, and their, their biggest question is always, Gary, why? Why? And if anything can answer the why question is, is, is only one thing that I've come up with, is that the world is evil. And so I want to explain it to you in this way. There's darkness and there's light. Now God is light and we are light. And, and light and darkness are not opposites. Okay? They are not opposites. Light is the, is, oh, I'm sorry, darkness is the absence of light. So in other words, we're in a room right now and we could turn out all the lights and you wouldn't be able to see. So what would even a flashlight, someone would pull out their phone, right? And they'd turn on their flashlight. And suddenly we could see. Why? Because that light dispels enough darkness that we can see what's going on. So light is not the opposite of darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. And so we live in a dark world. And what does the world need? It needs light. So the only answer we can come to the why question is because we live in an evil society. We live in a place that's trying to, to create morality in a heart that's darkened, that says, I want to be an individual. I want to do my own thing. I don't care about your rights. My rights supersede your rights. And then the other person says, no, my rights supersede your rights. Then we have to decide whose rights are the right rights. And we cannot because we've come to this place where we have no no ability to decide what's truth anymore. And so it's really funny. In Judges chapter 21, the very last book, way back, we're talking a thousand years before Christ even. So we're talking three to four thousand years ago. It says it was recorded. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's not a good place to live. That's not a good place to live. And so now we don't know who's, how to say, well, you have to give up your right for this person's right. And so we don't know how to live that way because we've all been told to get as many of our rights and keep as many of our rights as we can. So darkness and light, that's the, why, that's the answer to the why question. Okay, so what do we need? We always say we need answers. We need to know why this happened. We need answers to tell us how, to, how this happened and why this happened. And we need answers so that we can create solutions. And so the world wants to create the solution. Right now, the big discussion is how do we, how do we secure our schools? And so there's a couple of thoughts on that. We, can, we could bolt them down and put barbed wire fence around them and you'd have to crawl through a tunnel to get in or you know, that would solve it. Or we could eliminate all the guns in America and that would fix it. But you know, everybody's got a solution. Now we just argue about our solutions. And so we try to come up with a solution that makes sense for everybody. And there is no, there's no answer that makes sense for everybody, right? So how do we protect our children when we live in a dark world? So we try to legislate. We can't, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. You're not, you know, it's bad to do that. We say what's right and what's wrong. And it never works. 
We're trying to legislate morality. So this is what we need. This is what we're looking for, okay? Now, here's the problem. When we talk about remembering things, we're always talking about history, aren't we? Because remember means we're looking backwards, right? And here's the thing about history. History driven by, this is just, this is tweetable. I wish I had a good tweeter handle or something, Twitter handle or whatever, or an Insta account. I don't really have one. But history driven by human nature is ugly. And I was trying to come up with a better word than ugly, but ugly kind of sits. It fits, doesn't it? Ugly. Why? Because it's self-centered or it's man-driven. It's not God-driven. And so we, we tend to live in this place where history is ugly. And, and there's an old saying, right? I don't know if you've heard this. Like, Those that don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And so there's a thought there. It's like, well, are they doomed to repeat it? Or do we learn from it and try something new? But that doesn't work either. And that's typically what happens. So we had World War I, and we said, oh, well, we'll never have that. We'll never let that happen again. And so we put some things in place that that would never happen again. And then, what, 30 years later, we had World War II. It happened again. And so they said, oh, we're going to have to do something else about that. And then we had this war and that war. And every time we have a war, we try to adjust. And that's only in the time of the history that we know, you know, that we kind of recognize as history. But if you go back further, you've got the 1800s, there was wars. And you go back further, you know, you keep going back and you keep looking. And we, we repeat over and over again. Why? Because history driven by human nature is ugly. Because it's not, it's not, it's not light. It's darkness trying to drive, drive history. So we can say like, well, now we've, we've made history. Okay. Well, if we don't learn from it, we'll repeat it. So looking back at history, we see human nature involved in all of it. And it's really bad. Okay. So I started looking back to find out what was the problem. And I went back into the Old Testament because there's so much of history that talks about why things happened and why it was driven by man. So I wanted to go back in, into the, to the old prophets, in the Old Testament, the prophets, okay? Now there's one thing, just so you know a little bit of history here on the Bible, right? There's two groups of people really in the Bible that talks about all the time. There's prophets and there's priests, okay? So prophets and priests, two groups. Now here's the deal. The priest, his job was to offer sacrifices for the people so that they would become acceptable to the God. And then there was the prophet. And the prophet's job was to say, thus saith the God to the people. So the priest was from the people to God, and the prophet was from God to the people. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Okay, So now what typically happened was a, a prophet, they always had priests, they had the Levites, and the Levites, and they always were going through, and they just did their thing. And they're always offering sacrifices to make themselves acceptable to the God. But every once in a while, a prophet would show up, and he would say something like this, Thus saith the Lord, or thus saith the Lord God. All right, And they were like, ooh. Now, there were serious rules about being a prophet. You only got to be wrong one time. And if you were wrong one time, the penalty was death. Like you were a false prophet. You weren't allowed. And so they was like, whoa. Like, so you didn't walk around just going, you know, oh, you know, I got a word from the Lord. It's going to rain tomorrow. You, di you didn't dare do that because if it didn't rain tomorrow, they could take you out and get rid of you. Okay? So Isaiah was a major prophet. Now, there's two kinds of prophets in the Old Testament, major prophets and minor prophets. I would have been a major prophet because I talk a lot. Okay? But a minor prophet, no, nah, they just talked a little bit. So the only difference between a major prophet and a minor prophet is how big the book is they wrote. So Isaiah had a lot to talk about, major prophet. Jeremiah had a lot to talk about, a major prophet. Micah, Jonah, eh, little book, little prophet. So somehow they just called them major and minor prophets, okay? So no big deal. So Isaiah here is talking, and this is God. And he's saying, woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan, but not mine who make an alliance, but not of my spirit, right? In, and in order to add sin to sin. So what he's saying here is he's like, people are making plans, but they're not my plans. People are, people are kind of setting things up, but not based on the spirit of God. And what happens is it just piles up. It just gets, it just gets piled up. And so if you ever made an agreement, you're like, whoa, that was a bad agreement. So you have to make a different agreement. Like, I don't know if you know this or not, but laws beget laws. Did you know that? For every law they create, somebody finds a loophole, don't they? You know why our tax code is like this thick? Because they said, 
you got to pay this much tax unless and then they gave it well so then i did well no no we didn't mean it like that so they put this you know well oh no we didn't mean that so it just grew and it grew and it grew right so now tax code is like this just to pay some money and so what happens is this is god telling the children of israel like they're rebellious children so let's just say they're walking in darkness right? They're walking according to their own thoughts, declaring the Lord, all right? And so now look what happens. This is a little bit further in the same chapter, Isaiah chapter 30, which, by the way, if you read it, it's like, it's filled with this stuff, but I'm being kind and only reading certain parts of it, right? For this is a rebellious people, false sons, who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord. Now, this is, this is like, hmm, 2,500, 2,700 years ago that this was written about people? Now, could you not say this is pretty accurate for today? People refuse to listen. Now, what do we want them to listen to? Me? Well, no, no. We want you to listen to God. And they're like, oh, no, don't get, don't get God involved. Now you're getting all weird on me, right? But this was happening so long ago. They were not listening. They refused to listen. Then this is the next verse. Who says to the seers, don't see visions. So these were people that had the ability to sort of project the pro prophetic things. And they said to the prophets, don't prophesy what is right. Instead, speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. This is what we live in today. You want to know why the world is messed up? Because we live in these verses. We live in, they're back here. For me, they're up here. Where they're here. We live in these verses right? We, not only do we not want to tell the truth, don't tell us the truth. In fact, just make something up that we like. Because that's, you know, don't get on my case. If you've had any kids, what do they say? Why are you always on my case? I don't know. Maybe that's just old people's dads used to say that, right? Why are you on my case? Why are you giving me such a hard time? Don't speak to me with real prophecy. Don't tell me truth. Just make it an illusion. I like that better. We're going to find that in the New Testament too. Okay, so what's happening? What's happening back then? What's happening today, right? It says, this is Jeremiah. Same idea, same. They were kind of, he and Isaiah lived at the same time, kind of. From the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. Can you not see that in society today? What do we always want? Like right now in America, great time to sell your house. Not a good time to buy a house. But it's a great time to sell your house. People are selling their houses. Why? Because they're getting gain. It's like, well, now where are you going to live? I'll worry about that later. Then they complain. Oh, there's nowhere to buy. It's like, no, right? Great gain. So we're looking for gain. We're always looking to get ahead. We're always looking to get more. Now, I want to tell you something. I, I'm going to tell you today how much money is enough money. Okay? So this is the best thing you'll ever hear. You know how much money is just enough money? A little bit more. Because if you had $100, you want $200. If you have $1,000, you need $2,000. If you have a million dollars, you need a million and a half. Maybe you need a million and one, but you need $2 million. There's never enough because it never, sati it never satisfies. It's never enough, right? There's never enough. Now, this is the weird, this is, I'll tell you the truth. I, I, I know, I'll tell you why I know this is true, okay? A friend of mine was involved in a software company in the 90s. And he, he was able to sell some stock and make eight and a half million dollars. In one day, he made eight and a half million dollars. His stock went from pennies to millions of dollars. It was kind of like, it was an amazing story, right? And so he and I are good friends, and we were talking one day. We were actually on a mission trip together. He's a great man of God. And, and I was talking to him, and I was like, what was it like to make eight and a half million dollars in one day? He said, I couldn't sleep. I was like, you couldn't sleep? I'd have slept like a baby. I got $8 million in the bank. I am, I'm set. I'm good, right? He said, I couldn't sleep. I was like, why not? He said, I couldn't sleep for a week. He's like, why? I don't understand why you couldn't sleep for a week. He said, I could have sold it the day before for $8.9 million. He'd made eight and a half, but he couldn't sleep because he could have had 8.9. We live in a greedy society. It's not always maybe money, but it's stuff, right? We need bigger stuff, more stuff, bat, bat, better stuff. I almost said bad words there. Some bigger, badder stuff, right? 
more money, and we think more money will get it. So then we go after more money, and we're looking after the wrong things, okay? Even the prophets were taught, even the prophets were dealing falsely. Even the people of God weren't the people to look up to, right? I don't know if you're big into the Southern Baptists, but at the Southern Baptist Convention this week, they've had a big, woohoo, they're in trouble, right? Because there's released a report of 700 people who were not dealing well. They were saying one thing and doing something else, and now, it didn't come, and now it's come out. And it's like, uh-oh, they're in trouble, okay? They were dealing falsely with the people. So thousand, you know, 3,000 years ago, they had the same problem we have today. We haven't fixed anything. So when we think about, oh, if we just look back and learn from it, you aren't going to fix it. You can't fix the problem. You need to know what the problem is. The problem is darkness. Let's just get more specific. The problem is sin right? And sin is this thing that's against God more than it is against each other. If I offend you or if I, if I assault you, that may be a personal assault against you. But as a Christian, I'm actually assaulting God. I'm actually, I'm actually harming God in that because I am doing something that's against my nature. And so this is from years back. I told you I get dark, right? All right. So in the same, same chapter of Jeremiah, they have healed the brokenness of my people and it's this cool word, superficially, is the English word for it. Surface. They just fix it on the surface. Right? And so what happens to a cut when you put a Band-Aid on the surface, but it really needed stitches? It gets kind of messed up down inside, doesn't it? And it takes way longer to heal, right? You have to open up that wound and you have to scrub out all the dirt and debris and all the sin and all the darkness and all the infection and then you can cover it up if you just and i know this by i know this by personal experience too on a mission trip to haiti i i got to do the clinic and the clinic was like amazing and really bad all at the same time all right well this little girl had come in and she had fallen on some concrete and literally ripped open her shin and it was just all the, all the way up from her ankle to her knee. She had just split it open. Big gouges. I don't know if it had, I don't know how she did it, but she, it was just blood and guts everywhere, right? And they were like, okay. I was like, she needs stitches. Like, no, we can't stitch her up. It's like, no, you have to stitch it up. He goes, no, nah, we stitch her up. We'd put infection in there and there's no hospitals around here and she can't get seven rounds of antibiotics. So we have to leave it open and we have to clean it out as best we can and we'll put some salve on it, but we're going to leave the wound open. Because if we closed it up, she'd lose her leg. And I'm like, oh, wow, there's some serious spiritual application to that, right? And so they healed the people superficially saying, peace, peace, but there's no peace. That's where we live. When we look to man to be our, our peace, they tell us there's peace. They try to fix things superficially, but there is no peace, and they don't fix our brokenness. Okay, so again, think about this. Remember that this is the problem from thousands of years ago. It's human nature. It's people without God. It's people walking in darkness. That's the problem. It's not how many laws we have or if we do this instead of that. that those are good things. There's not bad to have those, but they're not going to solve the problem. They're superficial, right? The problem is deeper, isn't it? I mean, I've had, I've had weeds in the yard, and I know one thing for a fact. If you pull the tops off of dandelions, that doesn't fix anything. That doesn't fix anything. In fact, I think it somehow it makes them grow stronger underneath the surface, right? To get rid of a dandelion, you've got to kill the root. You've got to get to the bottom. You've got to get to the problem, right? And I know if you get a splinter in your finger, what happens if you leave that splinter in there and just put a Band-Aid on it? It gets ugly, doesn't it? It has to get taken out, Okay. So darkness is the problem. The absence of light is the problem. Sin is the problem, okay? And so thousands of years ago, and God was saying this to the children of Israel so that they would understand. The problem isn't you all. It's the fact that you're not listening to me, and I'm God. I don't know about you, but isn't it smart to listen to the people that kind of know? God knows. He knows the answers. He knows what society needs. He knows what people need. He knows what you need. He knows what I need. The first thing we need is salvation, isn't it? That's the very beginning of everything, right? And so the idea is that God said, look, there is sin, and I need some way to cure this for them. I need, to, I need a cure for the sickness of sin. And he sent Jesus Christ. 
And Jesus Christ died on the cross so that, so that his sacrifice on the, on, the, on the cross would give you life. And so it was a substitutionary death. He exchanged his righteousness on the cross for your sin. He gave you his righteousness and he took your sin, right? So now there is a solution to the darkness. There is solution to the sin. What is it? It's God through Jesus Christ, his son. And you say, well, that's very exclusive. No, that's God. He said that. I didn't make that up. I'm not some brilliant guy in the 21st century who goes, you know, the way we could fix this is if we said God, and I'm making this up. No, this is from the beginning of time. There has to be a payment for sin. There are consequences for sin. So how do we get rid of sin? It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. It sounds gory. I didn't make it up. That's the way God said it works. There has to be a payment. The innocent for the guilty. Let's say it that way. Right? So the innocent Jesus Christ paid the price for the guilty us. And he exchanged it. So now if we trust that, if we believe that, if we understand that that's the truth, then God accepts that and takes us in and now we become a new creation, the Bible says. It says, old things are passed away, all things have become new. Even in the Old Testament, he says, I take out your heart of stone and take out your old spirit. And I put a new spirit in you and a new heart in you. And then I put my spirit in your spirit. Now you and I are one. So I and God are one. God in me, me in God. Okay. Now I have light. So the goal is I walk around in darkness going, why is it so dark in here? Y'all are stupid. Y'all are dark and you don't get it, right? That's not being light right? Like if you took a flashlight and said, oh, you guys can't see here. Let me shine it in your eyeball. You're like, wow, get that out of my face. I can't see a thing, right? We're supposed to be light in the world. So the people say like, wow, he has light. I need to hang out with him. Why? Because I see better when I'm hanging out with him because he has light. You see the difference? So I'm not beating people with my Bible. I'm trying to say, hey, there is light here in a dark world. You want to know why we got problems in America? I'll tell you why I have problems in America. Because it's dark. That's why. What's the solution to darkness? Light. Guess what you and I are? Light. Okay? That's our job. To know we're light and be light in the darkness. Don't beat them up with it. Show, show them the way through what you do. Okay? So he's saying peace, peace. There is no peace. Okay? So what do we need? We need answers. Everybody wants answers, don't they? How are we going to fix this? This is ridiculous. And we've got politicians on from, from here to here telling us how to fix it. This way is this way, and this way is that way. No, no. And then they're all up there fighting over which is the best way, and they get nothing done because nobody can agree on what's the right way to do it, right? They can't legislate this into being. It has to come through God. It has to come through light. We need solutions. Okay. So here's the solution. Jesus, in John chapter 14, peace I leave with you. There it is. He's like, look, I'm leaving and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And as one of your disciples, I'm giving you my peace. I am peace. I'm the one that solves all these problems. And I, that fixes it. I'm the only thing that fixes it. I am peace and I am giving it to you. My peace I give to you. And then he even goes further to contrast it, right? Have you ever had to do that in college, like compare and contrast the following, you know, right, ideas or something? He's comparing and contrasting. My peace I give to you. Not as the world does I, as the world gives do I give unto you. Then he says this, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be fearful. Now, I'm not afraid of dying. I mean, I don't want to be there when it happens, but I'm not afraid of dying, right? I don't want to die a miserable, lonely death, but I'm not afraid of dying. I'm going to die. I hate to tell you this, you're going to die. Newsflash, right? You don't want to die in some awful accident. You want to die in some horrible way. I guess we all want to die after having a giant steak meal. We want to go to bed at 110 and never wake up. Maybe that's how we all want to die. And it doesn't happen that way, but we all die. So here's God saying, look, I'm going to give you peace. So even if you die, your heart doesn't have to be troubled. You don't have to be fearful of death. Why? I've conquered death. You may die physically, but you will never die spiritually. You'll be alive in me forever. Relax. Be at peace. Okay? What does the world need more than anything? They need peace. The young man that died this week, he took his own life. He was 35. He was an Eagle Scout. He was a Georgia Tech grad in three and a half years, I might add, 
right? He, ran, he was a successful engineer. He had his own consulting firm. He lived in the mountains of Colorado where he got to ski every day at Breckenridge and other places like that. He was 35, well off, and he took his own life. Now, I don't know what happened, but here's what I know. There was no peace in his heart. There was no way there was peace in his heart because if there was peace in his heart, then it didn't matter what problem or what obstacle he faced, he could face it from a position of strength or a position of peace. Now, does this mean everything goes well in my, right, in my life? No. We're going to have problems. I have problems, you have problems. Some of us older have more problems, right? And so he says, don't let your heart be troubled and don't let it be fearful. Please don't be afraid. Trust me, I'm your God. I will be with you. David said it like this, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil because thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. So David was comforted by the fact that God was with him. Why can't we live that way? Why are we stressing? Why are we trying to figure? You see, and if Christians, if we're all stressed out, if we're the ones that are freaking out and we have no peace about it, then we can't share peace with the world. We have to be fixed up straight. We have to get our minds right. We have to have our peace. Our flashlight has to be bright. Why? So that we can shine it in this lost and dying world that needs peace and needs light. Now, this was fascinating for me too. This is kind of where this whole, this, believe it or not, this is where the whole thing started for me. Was when I, when I was talking to uh, Pastor Dean, he said, can you come on Memorial Day weekend? I'm like, yes. And then I thought, okay, that's memory. And the first thing came to mind, do this in remembrance of me. And I'm like, okay, then this, the whole thing came out of this, right? So 1 Corinthians, Paul's talking to the church in Corinth, and he's talking about the Lord's Supper. This idea that Jesus had this last supper with his friends, and he, and he said, this is my body which is broken for you, and this is my blood which is shed for you. And he gave them in the upper room, and they were like, this is creepy, this is not your body, it's some flatbread, it's pita bread, it came from the store, I bought it, right? And then this is my, this is my blood which is shed for you. And they're like, no, I'm pretty sure I got that from the, the winery this morning. Right? So they didn't quite catch the connection, but what he was saying was, I am the source of your life. It's my body that's broken for you, and it's my blood that's broken for you, so that you can have the light, so that you can have salvation, so that you can have peace. I must be broken so that you can be healed. It's always a, an exchange, right? I'm the one going to be broken so that you can be, so you can be healed. And then he goes and he dies on the cross. And years later, they're like, oh, duh, we get it now. They finally kind of put all the pieces together. So now Paul's writing to them. He says, I received this from the Lord, which I delivered to you. He'd been there. He shared this with them. And now he's writing that the Lord Jesus, in the night which he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is, is, is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he wants you to remember that his body was broken so that you could be healed. Never forget that. Always remember that, right? Then what did he do? The next verse says he also took the cup at the same time and said, this cup, look at this, is the new covenant in my blood. This is what gives us salvation. New covenant. This means the old covenant was fulfilled, completed in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means the law, which never could save me anyway. Keeping all the rules doesn't save you. Did you know that? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. The substitution of him for you is that what saves you. It's not how good you are. Because none of you are going to be good enough. You can't save yourself. Okay? So his cup is the blood of the, is the, a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we come to Memorial Day weekend and we think about, okay, we have to remember things. If anything a Christian should remember, it's that Jesus Christ died on the cross, a substitutionary death, that his broken body was exchanged so I could have a whole body. His blood was shed so that I could be made righteous and the wholeness of Christ. It was an exchange on the cross for me. That's what we need to remember. Why? So that, look at this, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, we're walking around saying, Jesus, this is the gospel in one verse, is it not? This is the gospel. Look, the world is messed up. Why? Man, I got a, I got a couple thoughts on that. You want to hear them? Yeah, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are. I'm thinking it's a dark place. Yeah, I could agree with that. Man, who's not going to, who's going to argue with about that? Right? Yeah, it's a dark place. So if this is a dark place, what does the world need? 
it needs some light. Yeah, I, I can see that, right? Well, guess what? Jesus Christ's death on the cross made provision so that you could be light. You could have light and be light to other people. Don't you want to help other people? Yeah, I love to help other people. I give my money or I give my time. And what has happened? Ah, nothing really. It just it seems to get worse and worse. That's exactly right. What they actually need is light. They need light. Okay? And so we proclaim and we remember Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. We remember that so that it's a part of being able to proclaim that he is light for us. You see how this works? So Memorial Day is a time to remember people that died in an American holiday way, but actually communion or this time where we take the bread and the cup, we remember what Christ did for us, and it's a time of celebration. It's a time of celebration. It's not a time of condemnation. It's a time of celebration that says, I'm excited to remember that Jesus Christ died for me, that my sins have been forgiven through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. I'm remembering you. And now I'm walking out here fresh and my light is shining and I am out there to help people. You see how it works? So I'm going to wrap up here. It's like, we're getting close. Second Timothy, Paul writes again to this young man named Timothy. He was a pastor. He left him in Ephesus to kind of manage the church. And he writes this. He says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, right? Repu reprove, rebuke, exhort. But here's the, here's the phrase, with great patience and instruction. All right. So my, my ministry, functional Christianity, is trying to help people with great patience and instruction. Here's how you do it. Here's how it works right? And as Christians, that's what we need to know. We need to know how this works. First, we have to know how it works for me, that I'm set free and I'm at peace and I go through stuff, but I'm trusting Jesus as I go through it. And as I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I don't fear evil because no evil can overcome my light. So in other words, if I'm a flashlight in this room and you said, well, we're going to bring in some more darkness. First off, I don't know how you bring more darkness in, but let's bring some darkness in. back that truck up and pour out some more darkness. I don't care how much darkness you got. My lights, the darker it gets, the brighter my light looks. Did you know that? Turn off all the lights. And my, if I turn on my flashlight now, eh, it's, it's competing against the other lights in the room that's, that's keeping the darkness at bay. But if you turn out all the lights, my flashlight's looking pretty bright. Right? So you and I are light to a lost and dying world. So what Paul's writing to Timothy is like, you need to preach the word, brother. And what's the word? Hey, the world's messed up. That's the word. And who, who will not agree with that? I'm pretty sure everybody says, they, uh, pull. How many people think the world's messed up? I'm pretty sure you'd get a pretty high, pretty high guess. On you would have a pretty high percentage of that, right? But what is it? In season and out of season. Okay. Sometimes there's revivals and sometimes there's not. You need to preach the gospel even out of season when it's not the cool thing to do. Right? And the world's going to tell us, oh, we're stupid and oh, we're hanging on to our, crux, our crutch or we're trying to do this to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. <laughs> no. You who don't know can't tell me who knows. Sorry. Right? You could, like I was an air traffic controller, certified eight years under my belt, did it every day, do it in my sleep, right? You who've never done it could not come up and tell me, well, this is how it should work. <laughs> like, no. Thank you for your input, but you're totally wrong. You have no idea what you're talking about right? Now, I don't have to say that from a, from a, 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 a boastful kind of position, but don't let lost people tell us, oh, you're telling, you're telling a stupid story. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, but no, you're wrong. This works for me. It will work for you. But hey, if you want to walk around in darkness and stub your toes on all the furniture that, that, that's all over the place because you're in darkness, keep going. But uh, I've got a flashlight. Would you like to, would you like, no, I don't need a flashlight. You guys are stupid trying to tell me I need a flashlight. I'm, I'm going to figure out, we're going to put, we're going to put markers where it is. We're going to memorize, keep trying to figure it out. But all I'm telling you is it's dark and I got a flashlight. Preach in season, out of season. They're going to tell you you're dumb. I don't care. Tell me I'm dumb. What do they know, right? But it's with great patience and with instruction. Okay. Now, Why? Again, this is 2,000 years old, but look at, look at the text. From time, for a time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. They're going to be like, nah, that's stupid. You know what? You're being, can I say fuddy-duddy, an old fuddy-duddy? I don't know if you even know what that means. I don't know. 
You're just being old fashioned. You're just, you're just, no, that's stupid, right? What? But wanting to have their ears tickled. Remember the Jeremiah thing? Show us illusions, ears tickled. Same passage, right? Same idea. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. So in other words, I, I, let's say, I don't know, I'm overweight. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run a camp to teach you how to be overweight. And be like, well, I'm already overweight, so I'm going to join that club, right? So I'm going to have a teacher that can teach me how to be fat. Why? Because I'm fat. I like being fat. I don't want to get skinny, right? And so what's happening is people accumulate teachers that t tell them already what they, wa what they want to hear. Like, here's what I want to hear. Well, don't be telling me that kind of stuff. That's kind of like convicting or something. You're trying to shine your light, and that's shining, messing up my darkness. I'm going to go find people to tell me what I want to hear. Now, we have that all the time, right? Look at, the, look at the amount of Facebook groups we have in the world. And what does a group on Facebook do? It's all around. Everybody joins that group based on what? The similar likes and tastes. Now, if somebody goes in that room and goes, blue, that's the stupidest color I've ever seen. Red is the actual best color, right? They're going to kick you out of that room. They're going to say to you, well, why are you in the blue room? There's only people here that like blue. Well, but red's an option. No, it's not. Blue's the color, right? If you, if you start watching cat videos, guess what the internet feeds you? More cat videos. But guess what dog watchers get? More dog videos. So now what do you got? You got someone going, oh, the dogs are the best ones. No, no, the cats are the right ones, right? Because you keep getting the same thing fed to you. It's tickling your ears. It's trying to tell you that this is the only right way. Why? Because that's what you put up there. I have no idea what Facebook will do with this text. Who knows? Right? But they, they want their ears tickled. So they accumulate teachers according to their own desires. Facebook groups. Modified search engine results. Right? <laughs> Just think of that. And they turn away their ears from the truth. And they turn aside to myths. Okay? Do we not live this verse today in, in social media and in the world? We've turned to myths. We don't even know what's true anymore. So here's an opportunity for us as Christians to say, look, here's some truth. Chew on this. What about this idea? How about we live in a dark world and we need light? And how about God as that light? What if we actually came under the authority of someone who is greater than us? Now, that doesn't preach well, right? We want to be our own individuals. So... Let's close up with this. Back to Isaiah. The Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. So is God angry? No, God's not angry. He's, he's, he's like, I have flashlights for everybody. Please come and get a flashlight. I'm going to stay in the darkness. Oh, please come and get a flashlight. It will help. I'm telling you the flashlight will make such a difference in your life. Nope, I'm going to stay in the darkness. How dare you think I need a flashlight? I can stumble around on my own. I can create my own flashlight. No, you can't. Please come and get a flashlight, right? So God isn't angry saying like, if you don't get a flashlight, it's like, if you don't get a flashlight, you're going to walk around in darkness for the rest of your life. And when you die, you'll be in eternal darkness. And boy, that's terrible. I don't want that for you. Please don't, don't be short-sighted in your darkness, right? For the Lord is God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him. You want to have peace? You want to have happiness? Long after God. Don't try to get his benefits, get him, and you get the benefits. In other words, don't say, God, I need, I need more of your peace. Well, I already gave you that. Okay, I just need more of you. No, I already gave you all of me. You have all of me. Learn to operate your flashlight. It never runs out. It doesn't need recharging. How'd you like to invent that, right? The iPhone that never needs recharging. Well, guess what? We have the light that never needs recharging. We have eternal life we have the eternal light in us, right? So then it finishes like this. We can't go backwards. We can't go back and fix what's happened. So what can we do? We can only go forward. I don't know. You guys drove home from the beach, right? How hard would it have been to drive home looking in the rearview mirror only? <laughs> like, oh, we just passed a mile mark. It's like, no, you need to be looking forward, right? So whatever mess you've been in, okay, I get it. It's a mess, right? Look forward. Don't look back. Right? How do I become more mature? I learn by remembering, oh, that didn't work out so well. I remember and I learn by moving forward. I can't go back and fix it. You can't unring a bell. 
If you made a mistake and hurt somebody, the only thing you can do is go back and say, I made a mistake. You can move forward by saying, I made a mistake there, and will you forgive me for that? But I can't go undo what I did. I slapped you. I can't unslap you. I said ugly words to you. I can't unsay them. You've heard them. I, I can't go back and fix it. All I can do is move forward. So I have to say, I'm sorry for moving. Will you forgive me for what happened in the past? And if they can't forgive you, guess where they're stuck? In the past. All right? So then it says like this in Philippians. Paul's talking, he says, not that I've obtained it, this perfection, not that I've already become perfected, but I press on. Why? So that I may lay hold of that which is also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. I'm walking in my light that God has given me. Not that I've perfected how to walk in this light, but man, I'm learning to walk by the flashlight better and better every day. I'm learning how to walk out the salvation that's been given to me. I'm not there yet, but I'm pressing forward, right? Look what he says. I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but this one thing I do, here it is, forget what lies behind and reach forward for what lies ahead. So we want to remember what Christ did for us to set us free so that we can press forward. And you make mistakes. Anybody not made a mistake? Well, you just made one there because you're lying. We all make mistakes. I, I was talking with a young pastor this week, and he said, I'm just trying to do everything right. I'm like, oh, dear goodness. He's like, what do you mean? That's a good goal, isn't it? Do everything right. I'm like, well, yeah, that's a good goal, but you're so bound up about trying to do everything right, you can't do anything. Should I go left or should I go right? I don't know. I need to pray. Lord, I'm trying to get to the store. Should I take a left to the mall or to the right to the store? He can't, he can't know which way to go. He's bound up because he has to make the right decision. I said, what happens if you make a wrong decision? Oh, I beat myself up like crap. I'm like, wow. So we have lots more to talk about in the future, right? He needs to forget what lies behind. It doesn't mean you don't remember it, right? You don't remember it, but, but forgetting what happened. He's like, okay, I messed up there. Okay, I'm going to put that behind me. I'm going to leave that. How does God forget our sins? You say, well, you can't forget anything. Well, he's forgotten our sin. Does that mean it never happened? No, it happened. And he knows it happened, but he's not bringing it up to you all the time. Right? So forgetting the past doesn't mean, oh, well, I, I, I forgot that I lied and stole and cheated. No, no, you remember you lied and cheated, but you're set free so you don't have to keep walking in that backwardness. Right? And then what do you do? You press forward for what lies ahead. Okay? I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that's what we should be after. We're trying to walk better with our flashlights. Are we going to make mistakes? Yes. Or sometimes we're going to leave it at home? I guess. We never leave it at home. We forget to turn it on. I don't know, I don't know where the analogy breaks down there, right? You have an everlasting light that's in you to guide you, to direct you. And sometimes we're like, you know what? I'm going to go without my flashlight today. And then you stub your toe and then you're all mad. Who are you mad at? You're mad at them for putting that furniture there. You're mad for them not turning the light. No, you live in a lost and dying world, folks. Turn on your flashlight. We need to learn how to use our flashlight so that other people see us walking in the light and go like, I finally figured out what I need. I need a flashlight. And they have one. How do I get a flashlight? The gospel is attractive. The gospel is good news. That's why it's called good news. It is good news. Why? That the world is lost and dying and they need a savior. They need light and we have that light. What does the Bible say? Jesus said in Matthew, let your light shine before men that they see your good works and glorify our father in heaven. That's what we do. We walk out this salvation in the strength of God's word, in the light that he's given us. So remember what Jesus did for you so that you can walk in that. Remember those that have lost their lives, pray for their families, but we can't fix that for them. We can only say this is an evil world and the solution is light. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you that you're the light of the world. And then Father, you've put that light in us so that we are now the light of the world. And Father, we have your light to shine on our path and that should shine on other people's paths as well. So Father, help us to see that we are light in a lost and dying world. Father, we hurt and it pains your heart that there's so much evil and evil things happen and people die needlessly and, and terribly. And Father, you're desperately wanting people to know there is a solution. It's you. 
But people don't want to hear that, Father. They want to go their own way and try to come up with their own solutions. So, Father, would you help us to know that you're the solution, see that we're light in a lost and dying world, help us to know that we live in a dark place, but we're light in the darkness, and that's attractive. Father, you are attractive. So thank you for sending Christ to die for us so that we could become the light of the world and that we can share that with others. That's the good news of the gospel. Thank you, Father, for letting us remember your death and burial so that we can walk in this newness of life to share with others. And I pray all this in Jesus' amazing name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.